thank you for coming tonight. And I think for your braving the elements, the, the few snowflakes that we saw, and the cold and the wet dampness, that you're going to be really rewarded uh, with something very special tonight. It's always special when Playmakers is here with us and you all get to just be so intimate with them and just <laughs> ask all these questions. So it's wonderful. Uh, my name is Alice Sharp. Joanne Abel is in Cameron Indoor Stadium about now, <laughs> getting ready for the tip-off, I'm sure, of uh, the women's basketball game. So that's where she is tonight. Uh, and so I, I'm pitch-hitting for her. Um, I want to call attention to a very special program that's coming up on Sunday. If you have not heard about it, um, it will, we'll be celebrating the 125th anniversary of the Herald Sun. And that's going to be at uh, 3 p.m. on Sunday. Steve Shule is going to lead a panel and have a conversation with Bob Ashley. So um, if you want to learn a lot more about the Herald Sun, then come on out on Sunday. And as always, I have to give my little pitch for support for Durham Library Foundation, which makes this series of humanities programming possible. But I have a feeling I'm speaking to the choir. <laughs> I know so many of you are supporters already. Um, um, and if you know someone who hasn't been attending, please bring them along to our next program, all right? Okay. Now, without further ado, I almost feel like I could do this introduction of Jeff without any paper, but I will, I will read it. I'll acquiesce and read this. Uh, Jeff, Jeffrey Menza is the Playmakers Associate Artistic Director and manages the education and outreach initiatives of the theater. He has been with Playmakers since the spring of 2007 and is a member of the Playmakers Professional Acting Company and has worked extensively throughout the Triangle, New York City, Minneapolis, and throughout the San Francisco Bay Area. As a company member with Playmakers Repertory Company, he has appeared in many productions, including Angels in America, Amadeus, and Nicholas Nickleby, a personal favorite of mine. He holds an AB in theater and performance studies from the University of California, Berkeley, and an MFA from the Professional Actor Training Program in the Department of Dramatic Art at UNC Chapel Hill. And he is a proud member of the Aqu Actors' Equity Association. So without further ado, Jeff, will you tell us about this wonderful production that is coming up February the 26th through March 16th? And I have a feeling some of you are season ticket holders out there, but if you haven't gotten your tickets, uh, you know you can go to playmakersrep.org uh, to make sure you have a seat in the house. Jeff. Thank you so much, Alice. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being here. But thanks for, for, as Alice said, braving the, the weather to have a conversation <laughs> about this this play. Um, so the, the, the play is called Love Alone, and it's by a, a, a woman named Deborah Salem Smith. It's, uh, it premiered in 2012 at uh, Trinity Rep, uh, which is in Providence, Rhode Island. And uh, the play, we're very lucky to have Deborah in residence with us. She's come back down to, to North Carolina. She's actually from North Carolina. She's from Charlotte. Um, and uh, her partner actually went to UNC, and, and uh, her partner's brother, uh, do you know his name? Eric Montrose. Oh! oh. oh. Yeah. yeah, so, it's so yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, I think she'd know, I, I don't yeah. know anything. Um, but so, uh, so this is a, somewhat of a homecoming for her to be back in Carolina, and uh, her first time collaborating with Playmakers, but um, at the end of this process, what we'll have is the, the final published script that'll be, um, uh, actually put out into the world. So it, it'll, it'll, uh, we're making some, some really important shifts to the text, uh, things that she had wanted to accomplish when she first worked on the piece and when it first premiered. Uh, she ended up actually directing that, that first production. And so this time the, the piece is being directed by a woman named Vivian Benish, who if any of you saw Red or um, uh, the Vibrator play uh, in the next room, she directed those two pieces. Uh, and, and we have a really incredible group of women working on this project. Uh, it is a uh, it's a play that that is largely about the lives of um, of these particular women, um, and it was very important to us that we hired the right person to t to helm the piece. And Vivian, with her incredible emotional intelligence and uh, a really strong theatrical visual eye, um, she just seemed like the perfect person. And, and one of the things too, the um, the piece uh, follows the 
the life of Clementine. This is Ariel Yoder is playing Clementine. Uh, and Clementine is a, um, a rock star. She has, she has a, a band called One-Armed Edna. And they're sort of a, a, a punk band. Um, and so the, the framing device that Deborah, the playwright, uses to frame this piece is that in, in some ways we're kind of, it's in this sort of fractured world of a rock concert because the music um, transitions from scene to scene. So uh, the scenes themselves are, uh, uh, they're interspliced at times where you'll have two different worlds going on simultaneously. Uh, and, and it kind of has this really interesting flow to it. And then in the middle of the, uh, a, a transition, this intense rock music comes in that is her band um, that kind of frames the whole piece. Um, and also, one of the things that, that, the, that Deborah felt really strongly about is that this is a, it's a, a space, the play itself takes place in a space that is um, coming and going. It's, a, it's in essence a waiting room. And so she and the, the scenic designer, Lee Savage, created a space that literally is a hospital waiting room. So it becomes lots of different things. It becomes the, the, um, the apartment of um, Jenny Wales' character, uh, Becca, uh, and her husband. It becomes the house that Clementine and her two mothers live, live in. Um, and, and it is also it can be the, the parking lot outside of, of the um, hospital where Becca works. Um, and the story itself follows the lives of these two families, in essence. So Becca is an anesthesiologist. And uh, she uh, performs a surgery. Well, she's not the surgeon, but she's in uh, the operating room for uh, Clementine's mother's surgery. And during the course of the surgery, something terribly wrong happens, and uh, Clementine's mother passes away. And, and what, what unfolds from there is this story about so many different things, but, um, but really about the, the challenge and um, the growth that happens after great tragedy, that how do we how do we survive? How do we move past that? And and what you know the, the potential for great growth as as the res, as a result. So working through the grief to find um, to find what's on the other side. Um, so it, it's a really interesting and powerful and poignant play, and uh, we're really excited to, to bring it to you. And and, what, and Sarah Smiley is um, our resident stage manager, and I thought <laughs> she's the he great hero of the theater. Um, and uh, I thought it would be really interesting to, to bring her voice into the conversation. She's come to these talks in the past, and um, of course she's so integral to the work that we do. And so I thought it would be a, a valuable voice to talk a little bit about how she keeps the ship on, on course. Uh, um, from the first rehearsal, well before the first rehearsal, all the way through to the, to the time that the piece closes. Um, so I thought to start the conversation, um, I, I wanted to, from all three of you to, to talk a little bit about the process of working on what is in essence a new play, so, uh, which is different in, in a lot of ways than working on an Arthur Miller play or uh, a piece that has, is set in essence, the text is set. Um, and can you talk a little bit about what it's like to, to work in that environment and, and also to have Deborah, the, the playwright in the room? I guess I will start. Uh, having Deb in the room is actually amazing because during the first week we sit around the table and talk about the script and do like analyze everything that goes on um, in the story and having her there was such an amazing privilege because most of the time I have a lot of questions that I have to answer on my own and bring out from nowhere. Um, but having her there was incredible because we could, you know, get her direct feedback, and she researched the play so in depth that any questions that we had were just immediately answered. And, um, and it's also great going through it. Um, we can sort of see how it's forming and see how it's changing. And she's there to put her input on the rhythm of the show, the the overall arc, and everything. So it's been great. And your character was based on a on a particular person. Is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah, she actually met, um, well, she didn't meet the, the daughter, but um, she had a conversation uh, with one of her friends about this young woman who was in the music business and like blew up basically, and um, she said that her, she met this young woman's father and he um, was told that she um, had the greatest amount of integrity that he had ever seen in anyone in the music business. Um, and so she sort of created the character based around that idea, um, which made me very 
Kathy because it's sort of central to the character and her story. Yeah. And wh what about you, Sarah? And, and from your perspective as stage manager, is it is it much different than working on a different type of play, like a, a Shakespeare or or any any other type of play? Um, it's a little different. It's, I mean, my job is a little more uh, in depth because if we do have the play around the room, and it's wonderful to have the play card room. I completely agree with uh, Ariel. My training um, is actually a new play back. It's a new play background. So when I was in graduate school, we did a lot of new plays, and we were always changing and doing things differently, and everything was changing all the time. Everything changes all the time with a straight play, like a Shakespeare or an Arthur Miller or something like that too. But with a new play, it's it's almost double sometimes. Um, the way the text can change, the way anything at any second can change, intentions, actors' intentions, uh, scenery, anything. It's just it's 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 a it's always just crazy all the time changing. So um, for me, uh, it would be, it's actually kind of a great honor to be able to be there with a playwright and hear the new words that, that she's um, uh, rewriting and, and some of the new, the new work and, and the new ideas that she's putting into the play. So it's kind, of like, it's kind of interesting for me to be able to record that and have it actually, it sort of feels like I actually have a hand in, in creating this new piece as opposed to just writing down what you know, the actors do and when they walk in here or they walk there or they pick that up or they pick that up. So it's, I actually sort of feel like I'm, I have a little bit more of a of a hand in, in creating stuff. Because I can write down new stage directions that would make it into the published version of the play. Um, so it's sort of like I get to put my own little stamp on it, which is neat, really special, it makes me feel a little more connected to the process. Yeah. And Jenny, you have a lot of experience with new plays I do, yeah. I do. I've done a lot of new plays. Um, I think the thing I love the most about it is that the, it, they feel alive in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, you don't, you, you aren't bringing your idea of what Midsummer is, or your idea of what um, the Crucible is into the room, or to the first read. So it's more, it's almost terrifying in a way, because <laughs> you don't have that to hang on to, you don't have the definitive things to research, or um, to Google, or, or but, but there's also a freedom to that, because it alleviates you of the pressure to live up to the idea of what a definitive production could be, right. which I don't think is really helpful in making theater to think about things as definitive. Um, it, it is more helpful to live in the room with the people. And there's a certain freedom for me, at least, in working on new plays. Um, yeah, because you don't have to be, it's not like you have to have, we all know or have this idea of like Olivier Tamlin. Yes. Yeah. But this is Jenny yeah. Wales, Becca. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right, right. Uh, yes, I mean, and then you, that, that's just like not even in, you know, like yeah. the, the fact that it's Olivier's Hamlet, like it's not in the room. It's yeah. just, we're just trying to figure, and we're trying to figure out how to serve the playwright as best we can. And I, and I think having her there is really helpful because the changes that she's made, they haven't been giant. It's not like she's shifting scenes. She's cutting an and, and she's adding an I. And you know, she's she really is, and, but it changes the rhythm of the piece when she does that. So to have her there to ask questions as far as like, she's a very specific writer. She writes a lot of overlapping. She uses the punctuation, um, is very important to her. And so to have her there to ask her, what does this dash mean? What does overlapping mean as opposed to like, so that we really have a sense of the rhythm and the, and the land that she's created. Yeah, and that's something that actually shows up a lot, speaking specifically about this, the, you know, I mentioned the, the fact that you'll have two scenes running simultaneously, um, but there is a lot of overlapping dialogue yes. and, uh, and a lot of thoughts interrupted, I feel like, you and I have talked about this a lot. Like Clementine, you see my entire script. Yeah, her entire script. Every time she she initiates a thought, and then it gets interrupted either by someone else or herself. So then she has to. to and so, I'm like, I, what is, is that particularly challenging? Have, I mean, I you know, talking about even the overlapping scenes. What's that like? Yeah, it's. Um, I'm finding out um, where I'm at personally. I guess in the process right now, as I'm discovering that Clementine is just operates on impulse. Um, which is sort of a departure from me. I'm more of I'm more of a calculator. So um, that and it's that dialogue and that um, those dashes is is very helpful to the overall character because that fuels my intention. Um, Dev knows what she's doing with that. 
Yeah. So what's the piece about for you guys? For all three of you. Um, I mean, we, we are, we're all kind of living in our own characters right now. So I, I, I will speak from, from Becca's ex experience. Uh, I, I, and then there's what it's about for me and Jenny. But for Becca, I feel like the piece is, um, and her journey is about, like, so, so she has always achieved. And she's always done it on in the path that you're supposed to do it. She studies and she achieves, and she's gone to Stanford and she's been a chief resident and she's gotten this major job and everything she's done. She dated the right person. She got married. They've moved home to be closer to their family now, so that she has this job in the hospital. And for me, this feels like the first time that she has tried to do everything by the book and then something still gets pulled out from underneath her. And how does her world change in regards to that? If you, you know, I, I feel for a, a lot of this, this piece is about um, the world is not a pretty place. And I think that um, the first time that you see the random ugliness of the world is uh, tragic um, because it changes it changes who you are and it changes your relationship to everyone walking around you. And you, yeah. She has a really telling moment too. She says that she and her husband, after she comes home and she's she's had this bad outcome, she's lost a patient, her first patient, um, and her husband's attempting to console her and says, every doctor has a bad outcome. You always, you've always said that. And you, what do you say in response? I say, but I didn't mean me. I yeah. never thought it would happen to me. And I think that's at the crux of, yes. of who she is in some ways, is this, this woman who had always thought that it would work out right, because yeah. she's doing everything right. Yes. She's following the right steps. Mm -hmm. so, so then what's it like when after, you know, I mean, it starts basically after the incident. Yes. So what's the journey like for you right now as you're working through it? Is it, <laughs> is it a fun one? It's terrifying. <laughs> um, it's terrifying. I mean, it's a, the, everything is falling apart. And it is, it, she, she, she is such a control freak and, and so has gotten it all right that mm -hmm. to have it start chipping away because of course whenever anything happens in our lives it affects every relationship that you have. And so this thing has happened in her workplace that is now a, is beginning to chip away at the relationship she has with her husband. Mm -hmm. Much like Ariel with, with her, her character Clementine not um, being able to finish the thought with the way that it's written. My character never responds directly to questions that are asked, mm -hmm. which is we talked about the other day, yeah. is that um, her husband keeps trying to ask her questions, but she doesn't answer them. She, she's still trying to work through what's happened to her. Um, so the, the journey feels messy, yeah. I think. Yeah. And that's, un, that's out of character for Becca. Yeah, but also so human too, right? But so human. So, yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about Clementine and, and, and how you feel, what this piece is yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting because we talked a lot about um, coping mechanisms and how we all deal with grief, um, because we all deal with grief in, in different ways. And um, sometimes what we need from others in a time of grief is not what they can give. Um, and I remember talking to Deb, the playwright, um, she said something really interesting about how we have always, we've grown up with the idea of the five stages of grief, um, but that doesn't really exist. Um, when we all have our personal journey that we go through after something um, intensely tragic happens to us, and um, we've been playing with this idea of who's taking care of whom, so uh, for my character, the journey goes from uh, me being taken care of as a daughter to then having to caretake my, you know, parent my mother in some ways, and also find my way back to um, the mother that I lost. Uh, there's, it's alluded to several times in the script that I wasn't, I wasn't especially close um, with my mom, um, and then losing her all of that guilt comes to the forefront and how do, how can I find my way in, to repair this relationship is also a huge part of the journey alongside with taking care of 
the mother that I still have. So. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and and Sarah, for you as like you know, you get to have the some of the bird's eye view watching it all come together. How 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 has it affected you in terms of just as a person, perhaps, or you know, in watching the piece? What what are you what are you noticing about it? Well, it's hard because I, I, I mean, I do, I try to, to keep a lot of emotion out of the rehearsal hall because I don't want to get too wrapped up in what's going on on stage or else I'll just stop writing things down and, and just stop <laughs> watching what's going on and I won't, I won't, I'll miss something. Um, but it's, it's, it's lovely to watch the journey that, that they're taking as, as, a, as a cast together. Um, I mean, I, every, every play that I work on, I, I, I look at it that way anyway. I mean, I find something in almost every play that I work on from the outside, it's like, oh yeah. Do that in my life, or how you know what's what Clementine's going through. How does that affect the relationship that I had with my mother before she passed away? So I mean, it, for me, most of the time when I'm working on a play, I tend to extrapolate what's happening on stage to my life, as opposed to actually going. I mean, I'm going through the journey with everybody, but in a, in a completely different way, um, failing the ship as it were. Um, so I tend to look at it uh, from just an outsider's point of view and. Almost like an audience member, and take those um, those stories and those um, uh, ideas and things that are happening on stage, and, and figure out how it fits into my life and how things that are that this story, this particular story, how it's relevant to me or to people or to things in my life. So once the once the piece, you so you go into technical rehearsals, it gets set, and then we you have the audience. What is, can you talk about a bit about your job in terms of? How you steer the ship from you know from this point forward, basically. From tech forward. Yeah, from tech forward. Okay. Well, um, I don't know how familiar you guys are with the phases of production, but we do have we have a pre-production phase, and we have the rehearsal phase where we have all the actors together. We're getting together in the, the phase that Jeffy's talking about tech um, is where we actually bring everything together with the lighting and the sound and the costumes and everything for the first time, and we go through that. And then after that's all kind of set and complete, we open the show, and then we're actually in performance in the performance phase of things. And during the performance phase, it's my job to sort of take over as director, not the director, but act in the director's behalf. And the, the textbook definition of stage management is maintaining the artistic integrity of the production. Um, and that's kind of basically what I do. I've, I've, throughout the process, I've listened to what the actors have said, um, how they've communicated with the director, how the director has communicated um, his or her um, intentions and ideas and, um, and things to, to the cast. And I, and I try to write down as much of that as possible. And then during the run of the show, I watch every show um, I'm calling all the cues for the show. Um, and then I make sure that the, the show is kind of in the same shape that it is when we uh, first opened it uh, at, on the last day of production. Of course, shows grow. I mean, they're, always, they're all organic. Every, there are going to be moments that the actors find on stage that are, you know, that the director didn't even think about. It just, it's just some spontaneous thing that happens on stage, and it's like this wonderful moment and epiphany that they have. It's like, oh, that's great. Let's keep that. Or they could come up with something that's completely out of out of the, uh, you know, Planet Nine, and it was like, well, maybe we should think about this, and where, did, where exactly did that come from? So I'll, I'll, I'll keep an eye on, on the intention of the actors in each performance and kind of, kind of guide them to make sure that they're staying within um, the realm of the director's vision, but also allow it to grow, because that, it has to grow. It always will grow, it won't stop growing, even, you know, even after it's closed, basically. So that's kind of good. Yeah. Are there questions out here about the piece? Yeah. When you talked about the playwright, mm -hmm. so this was done at Trinity, mm -hmm. and it's only been done once. Yeah. There was so a, a student. There was a college production, I think, in Utah after the Trinity right. production. Okay, so it's been done twice. Was she at, at Utah as well? She wasn't. She came out to visit because it was actually a, um, uh, a mutual friend of ours. Randomly mm -hmm. enough, uh, was involved in that production in Utah. And invited her to come and speak to the medical school and and speak to the cast, but she wasn't involved in that production. And so, tell me a little bit about the backstory of mm -hmm. how you decided to do this, yeah, and how she decided that she wanted to die and yeah, wanted yeah. to be here. Sure. As well. So, um, we met her. Um, uh, trying to remember the, the timeline, it was it was after that piece had, had first been produced. Uh, and she'd always felt that it wasn't complete. And uh, she met our artistic director, Joe Haj, at a theater conference, the, the Theater Communications Group, which is a, they have an annual conference. And they just got talking and um, had, they kind of hit it off and, and she asked if it would be okay if she could send her script. 
Um, and so he passed it on to me and I read it and uh, this was, this would have been in 2012, so we were looking at, we were looking at for last season, or this season actually, we were, con or no, I'm sorry, what am I saying? Previous season, <laughs> last year, we were thinking about it for that season. And then it didn't quite fit in terms of the rhythm of the, of the season and, um, but we both, it was sort of this thing that it was this play that was kind of gnawing there as a, like, just really interesting. And, it, and a, a really interesting conversation dealing with, you know, it, it, it deals with issues of, of gender and positions, of women in, in positions of power, it deals with um, uh, uh, gay rights issues, part, you know, partner benefits, partner um, rights, um, it, it deals with um, uh, medical lawsuits and um, uh, malpractice issues and um, just really some, some really compelling stuff. So when, we came, when it came to this season, we knew that we wanted to have, um, we were always thinking about how the balance is with, with gender among the playwrights in our season, um, as well as the artistic staff that we hire. So um, she was on a, it was on a list of plays by women that we were really interested in, and, uh, and then when we, when we contacted her about it, she was very excited, and, and very excited in particular to have Vivian uh, direct it, because Vivian was supposed to direct the, the premiere, but it didn't work with her schedule. So it just was this perfect alignment of things uh, for for her and and for us, so that that's kind of the the long and the short of it. Uh, she yeah. wanted to be here. Absolutely, absolutely. Essential. Yeah, I mean, you know, a playwright wants their their piece produced, uh, and uh, and we have a, a fairly good reputation nationally, so uh, people understand that if their work's coming here, it's going to be treated well, and and the artists who come here. We just had a closing toast with the folks who were working on Private Lives and the two guest actors who were were in it. They just they were so effusive. They just kept coming up to me and saying. You have such a great thing going here. You we can come back anytime. You just let us know. So it's uh, you know it's we I think people have a really good vibe when they when they leave here. So yeah, yeah. Two questions. One is um, how unusual is it in the bringing up of a new play that are done in this way? In other words, you're actually producing it mm -hmm. in a kind of unfinished manner. Uh, is that a usual pattern in theater that? several productions of it, uh, there's this much play, this much leeway. Yeah. That, that's one question. Sure. Uh, and I'm wondering on that question, what is this, is this at all allied, let's say, to Broadway plays that open somewhere else upstate? Uh, yeah. Um, the second question is, um, if you're acting director during the production, what's the director doing? Uh, working on another play. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the director's not there. Mm -hmm. The director leaves. usually leaves, um, unless Joe, of course, um, Joe Hodge is directing a play. We, oftentimes the director leaves after opening night and yeah, they're, right. they're gone. That's usually, yeah. Yeah, it depends. I mean, you know, if they're if they're in the area or if it's like our our boss, yeah. um, then he, you know, obviously he can just, can just come, come on down the stairs right. and see what's going on. <laughs> right. um, but if it's someone local or if they come back into town, we had one director, uh, Dominique Saran, mm -hmm. when he did his production of Imaginary Invalid last year, he stayed through the whole run and he watched every night mm -hmm. uh, from the center box where people enter. He was just standing out there highly watching the entire thing and conducting it too. Um, uh, but that's very unusual. But in, in answer to your other question about. Um, so, the process of working on a new play is uh, is generally like this. Uh, oftentimes, it's a bit more involved. Like the playwright, if it's a new new piece, the playwright is often in rehearsal a lot longer, and she's she's dropping in and out of this this process. So she'll be, but she was there for the first week. She'll come back when they're doing run throughs in the rehearsal hall, and then she'll come back for previews when it's in front of an audience. Um, but oftentimes, a playwright will be very wants to be very close to the first production because they want, you know, it's their piece, and they want to. Um, continue to work on it until they feel that it's ready for, for opening. I mean, there, there are playwrights who famously will, will stay in rehearsal and, you know, like, well, you think about Sondheim, and he previews his shows forever and ever and ever because he wants it to be perfect. Um, and then there are playwrights like Tony Kushner who, when his plays go back into production, like when they just revived, just, like several years ago, they re revived Angels in America, and he went back to that script and tore it to shreds. And, and, and like he, but he's a constant, like he's a famous rewriter. So they were getting new pages uh, throughout the process of working on that piece. Um, so, the, no, the one in New York. York. In New York. Oh. We actually used that. We used that text from the from the revised production in New York. Um, I don't know how we got it, but we got someone got it to us. 
and so we use that text. But um, uh, but in any event, it's different for each process. But when a pl when a, when the playwright's involved, um, if they're involved in the production process, things are going to change, generally speaking, because it's another opportunity for them to uh, to revisit a piece, especially you know in, in this particular case where the piece is premiered. But she wants this this to be the text for public publication. And generally, publication waits until the play has been produced several times. Well, doesn't not necessarily several times. Um, it's really when the when it, when the you know publisher says we want to publish your play. Um, so so there are I mean and I guess there are some plays that are published without production, but I think that's fairly rare. Um, so so and then in answer to your question about the out of town tryout thing, um, interestingly with this with this play and and with Deb's work, one of the things that's a real challenge for her is that if it gets an out of town premiere, it's really hard for her to get her work pr produced in New York because no one wants to do a piece that isn't a New York premiere if you're producing in New York. It's very rare that if it premiered at Yale Rep that they're going to, to, do a, to produce it in New York. Although that happens, like it happened with um, Marie Antoinette, which premiered in, um, uh, in, New York, in Yale and is now at Soho Rep. But um, these are so many details. I'm sorry that I'm, uh, so you got me going. No, 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 Yeah, no, so, so, it, um, so in essence, it, it, Deb, it's, it, literally, it's a challenge. In this piece in particular, she's talked about, um, when we, over email, we were talking about this, that, that it's been a challenge that her, and her agent, who of course gets the money, is like, are you sure you want to premiere that there? Because we could probably get someone here interested in, and then it would, you know, get in the Times, and then it'll get produced elsewhere, so that it has a longevity. Because sometimes things that get premiered in the regions, that's it. Then they don't have a life after that. So, yeah. Yeah. Who selects the plays for playmakers, and how far in advance do you work? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it's an ongoing process. So we just announced our, our what are we in, 14, 15 season. Um, and uh, that's something that we finalized probably in October with a couple variables. Um, but it's an ongoing conversation that uh, my boss and I are having, as well as all of the, the invest, invested uh, partners. So we're talking to the scene shop and the costume shop, and uh, we're talking to the prop shop and electrics and uh, all of those people. We're talking to the academic department, talking with Jenny about, she's also our education manager and does all of the, the student matinee programs. So we have to make sure that, that at least a number of the plays in the season are appropriate for middle or high school age students. So it's a lot of ongoing uh, conversations. And we also have to think about, like, this is very strategically placed, this particular play, because it's in between um, a big costume show, which is Love Alone, or sorry, Private, Private Lives, Lives mm -hmm. and a big costume show, which is Assassins. So this, is, this, this show is modern dress, intentionally, so that the costume shop doesn't kill us <laughs> and come to our offices <laughs> with, with knitting needles and do terrible things to us. Um, but so that we, we made it intentionally uh, with the idea that it's going to be modern dress. Um, so that's, that's all part of how we, we think of it. But we're, in, we're now talking about the season after 1450. So we, you, know, you get one done, and, and we're not even done with 1450 yet. We still have two plates yet. Oh, um, it's stressing me out a little bit. But anyway, so, so we're, we're in a constant dialogue about how we want to shape the thing. And it's a great place to work. Sorry. Say again? Can't reveal any of that, right? Oh, the, well, the oh, the, oh, the next down the road. Kill yeah, well, <laughs> this is, I think this is like videotape. I know, right? <laughs> and it's a great place to work in for that reason that we we that just said we all have those of us who are working professionals in the theater go to New York. We see other shows. We have friends that send us scripts. We're always reading scripts and. It's a conversation where it's like, oh my gosh, I just read this. Do you know that? Do you know that playwright? Do you know that she has another thing? Or I just went to see this piece that nobody, you know, there were 10 people there, but it's really cool. It might yeah. be. And um, I feel like everybody that works there really kind of has that uh, that conversation, that ongoing conversation. And then, then they make the decision. Yes. And do you have a sort of balance formula that you use? Like you'll have a Shakespearean mm -hmm. play? Yeah, we, so we have to be all things to all people at all times. So um, we, we, 
this is, our, our, our boss uses the metaphor of, of us being like the Met as opposed to the Whitney or MoMA. That we have to have a little bit of, it's a smorgasbord, if you will. Uh, and, and one of the things that we find very important and, and we really work hard to, to commit to is uh, that we want to reflect the diversity of our community. So, so not only in terms of ethnicity and gender, but also in terms of a diversity of storytelling. Um, in terms of the, the form in which it's delivered, so that's musical or classic play or American con uh, contemporary or American classic or, you know, a, a, a play from Europe or Asia or what have you. So, um, so we try and we try and create a, a real diversity of stories. Um, and then, in terms of the rhythm of the season, we do think a lot about that. Um, so, next season on our main stage, we open with a comedy, which is bon Vanya and Sonia and Masha and Spike, which is Christopher Durang's comedy. And then we go into a, a rotating wrap of A Midsummer Night's Dream and Into the Woods. So you have a Shakespeare and a musical, um, both dealing with magic, um, sort of taking the metaphor of the woods uh, um, in the same way that, that The Tempest and Metamorphoses took the metaphor of the sea. So uh, using that as the, the next uh, big theatrical event that we'll have. And then we go into uh, Alice Childress's uh, Tr Trouble in Mind, uh, very specific female African American playwright about issues of um, race and um, basically about um, uh, selling out uh, the, the challenge of, of fame versus your your morals. Um, so that that's in the uh, first show in the spring, and then we go into um, what are we going to next? Oh, then we go into a big American classic, uh, An Enemy of the People, which is. Uh, uh, Arthur Miller's adaptation of Ibsen's classic play, and then we close with a like a little elegant schooner, um, which is Four Thousand Miles, uh, a new play by Amy Herzog, um, and that was just in New York. And it's been published. And it has been published. <laughs> yes, uh, it's not. No, she, she, she probably won't be coming down. Amy probably won't be coming down. No. Um, although it'd be nice if she did. Yeah. Um, so so that's that's the the rhythm of it is like, um, you know, again a big American classic in between two smaller shows. Um, so thinking about the rhythm for the shops, thinking about the rhythm of, uh, of what the audience experience will be like, um, you know. So that's kind of it. Sort of a long-winded answer. Yeah. Okay. I wondered, um, has Playmakers received any kind of national acclaim for stage? Well, uh, we've been named uh, one of the um, America's top 50 regional theaters. Um, and we were recognized by the Theater Communi Communications Group. Um, I mean, the highest honor that, that one a theater could receive would be the regional Tony, which we, we haven't received, but um, if you know anyone on the Tony board, uh, <laughs> please feel free to, to send them my way. Um, and, uh, and that's something that, that you know, uh, would be a huge honor, um, but very few theaters actually have received that honor. So there's, there's not, there's but not. specifically for staging. Staging specifically, like, you mean, do you mean in terms of sets and that yes. sort of thing? There aren't really any national awards for that. We've been we've been featured in American Theater Magazine, but um, we there aren't really uh, that I know of. Can you think of anything? No. Other than American Angels in American Theater. What was that? Was that Angels in American Theater? That was uh, uh, the Illusion. I oh, the Illusion. Think. Yeah. Um, so so you know, and then and then our our production teams have won awards for at like, USITT, which is the you saw it. United States Institute of Theater Technology. So they go and they'll take costume elements or, or uh, do presentations on a particular scenic element, and they've won a, lot, a ton of those awards. They win pretty much every year uh, because our grad students coming out of our MFA programs in, in costume technology and theater technology are some of the best in the nation. Uh, so that's, that's a really great honor. Yeah. yeah. Going back to the play, yeah. what kind of um, research did you do for your role, yeah. and maybe for your role as well, but especially you know, it's how, interesting. how real is the metaphor? It's really real, actually. Um, what's, we went, so last Wednesday, we went and met with an anesthesiologist at UNC, and we spent two and a half hours with him, he took us into the OR, and um, ran us through everything, and one of the first things he said to us was, who is this playwright? She must have done her research because there was only like one thing that flagged for him that didn't read completely true, and that was, upon our conversation with him, was it, it was 
a moment where information has to be passed. So the audience needs the information that I'm giving. Mm -hmm. But as far as everything, he's like, well, all anesthesiologists know there's an incident between um, smoking and bronchospasm. We all know that. And I was like, right. <laughs> so we need to, yeah, we need to make that clear. So but that was his only comment. Um, and we have there's a uh, there there is a deposition in the script as well. And um, and we had a, a person, David Ball, come in and talk to us, and he said, there, "This is who did the, who did this play? The research is impeccable." So the feedback that we've gotten, um, Deb's partner is a doctor, and I know that she she just did very, very specific research while working on the piece. Yeah. And then what about the music? I mean, who chose the music? Yeah. And yeah. Um, Peter Kendall, who is a recent graduate of uh, Brown Trinity Rep, um, composed all of, so all of the music um, in between those scene transitions um, is original, um, it's an original piece. Um, and he is amazing. And he, we've also um, created a new song that may or may not be used. You'll have to come <laughs> what we're gonna do, um, but it's beautiful, and he he did it in a in an afternoon. Yeah, he afternoon. put together an entire new original song for the piece. Um, so I know that him and uh, the playwright worked very closely um, for the, you know, when it came down to the the feel of the music um, and all the different influences. And uh, before we even started, um, I got in touch with them and just sort of created a playlist for myself because he has a lot of different influences that he. From. Um, what are some of those? Yeah. Um, he, <laughs> I don't want to say one of the names because it's kind of inappropriate. Um, there's a lot of different band. Uh, y Oak is one of the one of the band names that he gave to me. Uh, Cat Power, a lot of that sort of stuff. So um, there are some punk influences, um, but it's also it's a it's a totally original sound. You know, I couldn't I wouldn't be able to compare it to Joan Jet, uh, even though. It has some of that in it. Um, it's not. Ca it, I don't think it falls under one category, which is amazing to me because the music is such a life force of the play as well. So when a play does get published, then will the music get co-published? Piece like this, the music, if, if music is so integral to the piece, will the music be co-published? No, not generally. Um, the, 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 it depends. So the, the music that, that Peter has created for the piece um, is really only recorded. It's not necessarily handwritten, although the last song is probably scored. Yeah, for, I think so. Um, so right, but the, a real debate is, um, so one of the, as written, the piece at the end um, that she's talking about, there's a um, the piece Landslide um, uh, by Stevie Nicks. Stevie Nicks, thank you. Um, that was written into the piece to close the play was with that song. Uh, and then there became this question of whether or not it would be able to we'd be able to license the piece, um, so uh, which we were. Um, but it, just in case, uh, Deb wanted to have an alternate song in case a theater couldn't license the um, license that song. What we're trying to do is is create a system where, if you license the play, then you have the option of licensing um, Landslide or this other song when you when you choose to, to make that decision. Um, but all the, the sort of, I, I imagine there's a world in which uh, if you license the play for production, you could probably get this music that's being created for our production, you could probably license that as well from the designer. Um, but oftentimes, you know, a, a director who comes to that piece is going to want to create their own thing because it's like, you know, this is one particular vision for the piece, and they may have a totally different idea of how that's supposed to sound. Yeah. Like for private lives. So yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, other things? Wonderful use of the piano, by the way. Oh, cool. <laughs> I'm going to do it. Yeah. Oh. Well, I'm, I'm going to take us away from this place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, we, you talked about how having the play right there has been really wonderful. Are there times when the, having the play right there is not so wonderful? <laughs> because it changes. I mean, it's just the changes just get to be. In this particular play, that's not the case. Right, because, I know, I know, right, because I know, I know. she's changing like an and and an mm -hmm. I. Mm -hmm. I have done work on new plays before where I have loved the playwrights that I have worked with, mm -hmm. but when but have been get we would get eight to ten pages of new dialogue like on opening, mm -hmm. 
which Whoa. you want to kill them. And that, <laughs> you know, like you do, you, you do. I mean, it becomes part of the job, especially if it is like a really new play that's its first time. And when you get it, I mean, we were rewrite, they, he, you know, rewriting scenes all through rehearsal. And then when we got into previews, it was like, oh, well, I mean, forget it. Like, this doesn't work. That doesn't work. This needs to go here. This needs to, at the end of the act needs to, which is exhilarating as an actor. It really is. I mean, I think it's one of the most fun things about, um, about working on new plays and absolutely exhausting yeah. because you, it's really, really hard to settle into what's actually going on because so much of your brain is trying to like catch up to did I insert the correct pages correctly into my brain that I'm just supposed to be doing? Because you've got to take the ones that you learned and put them away and then, you know, digest the new ones. So there are times when it's a challenge. Yeah. Um, I worked for, uh, for a, about a year and a half with a, a playwright in San Francisco who also directed his own work. Mm -hmm. And that is never a good idea. Yeah, it's like, because yeah. <laughs> like, there's no editor there, you know. There and and of course they have their own vision, and then they're just trying to make that vision come to pass, come hell or high water. Um, and so, so what ended up happening? He ended up collaborating with this this woman who served as his uh, assistant director, but she was really his editor. I mean, she was the one that was that was sitting by his side saying, that's not working, that's not working, mm -hmm. cut it, cut it. And actually, she's now an editor for film and TV. She, she moved from theater into film and television as an editor because she just has that really distinct eye for those types of things. Um, but that was the best thing that could ever happen to him, was that he had, because he was insistent on directing his own plays. Um, and, and that is real challenging. But anybody who writes, like you love your words. Yeah. You know, like it's, hard, it's really hard, they become like, you're, I dated a playwright, not anymore, but I dated one for a long time, and he would talk about his words as babies, and I was like, well, this is uncomfortable, and like, cross my line, because they are words, they are not yeah. children. Yeah. But I think there becomes that, you know, that, it, that connection. Yeah. 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 Is there ever a time when a performer, an actor, wants to, is just uncomfortable with the way something is written and wants to change it? Yeah. Yeah, sir. Okay. Just like in dance, you know, you always hear dancers talking about how things evolve during the Yeah. Process. There's generally speaking, I would say, if you're doing, especially a living playwright, and if they're not in the room, you're licensing that play as written. Mm -hmm. So, so in fact, it's actually against the rules. <laughs> it's uh, and then there, you know, there are playwrights like Samuel Beckett, who you're not only licensing the play and the words that should be, and his estate says, you cannot change a single word. You also can't change a single stage direction, so it has to be performed specifically as he says. Um, and, and yet, there are cases where, like, certainly with Shakespeare, um, where things are cut and you can do whatever you want because it's, you know, it's public domain. Um, and there are certain actors um, who won't say certain things either because of um, personal belief um, or, or what have you, um, and and that's it's it's its own little challenge to, to, to deal with, and the director has to negotiate that with the actor because um, the actor's hired to do a job, and the yeah. job is to speak the words as written. Um, so yeah, it's it's a, it, but that's an interesting. Um, it's my new play, say. Yeah, that happens all the time, though. I think. But there still is a line, though. I mean, I think that you're hi you're still hired to do a job, and mm -hmm. there is that dance of like I would. I mean, in any job, it's not usually a good idea to come in and say, "I want to do it my way." Yeah. <laughs> right. I was to that. It was just something that you know, because you say how how emotionally involved the actors get in the yes. part, and you you become home with it, and if there's something, you know, if that in that process there's something that really a little bit in our in our um, table, in our table work she changed some things based upon subconscious choices that we were making we didn't even know we were like she would come back the next day and say so the last couple times we've read this Ariel you've been doing blah 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 I want to keep that and it was like wow 
five or eight. <laughs> you know? So that does happen. Yeah. And I think in general, um, not only with new playwrights, but um, any, any piece in general, um, I feel like good actors approach it with this sense of integrity to the playwright and the words as, as written. That is separate from your process of you know, finding the character. That's just something that you bring in because we love what we do and we want to maintain that artistic integrity because of, you know, it's an honor to speak the word, it's, you know, it's an honor to tell these stories. And there's also, I mean, the, that's part of the delicious challenge of, of being an actor is you have a, a text that's given to you and you have to figure out the way, rather than going to the playwright and saying, this doesn't work for me, can you right. shift it to this? Right. Then it's it's about how how can I how can I inhabit that language and actually make it make sense and sound organic as if it's coming from from you know as if I didn't write it or uh, someone else didn't write it for me as if it's inspired um, and that's the real challenge is because sometimes you get some real humdingers from a playwright and you have to figure out how did, how is this going to sound natural coming out of my mouth. For instance, um, <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, well, like this particular play, uh, the first scene of the play is of my character, the doctor, giving her mother, who's not here, the news that her partner has died. The first, that's like, here we go, we're off. And if I would love to not have that be the first scene <laughs> in the play, Jenny Wales, like because I find it really difficult, and to start at that place of being a new doctor, there for three weeks, just out of med school and residency, and being thrown into the wind by the surgeon to go deliver this news. So it's a challenge for me personally that I have to put away in some place because that's where the play starts. And that's, you know, that, that's, what, that's what the job is. But yeah, it's t I mean, there's that like, I would love it if it, if it, could we have like a romantic scene with my husband first, or I'm like coming in and give him a, number a yeah, musical number, <laughs> give him a foot massage, that'd be great. Because then you're like easing in instead of just, but that's, that's what it is. So. Yeah. Yeah. Other things? So are you a musician? Are you going to I am not. <laughs> <laughs> I only have to play um, one song on the acoustic. I've been learning to, um, like he was talking about, the okay. options. Um, but, I, but I'm able to simulate um, playing the electric guitar, which is hallelujah. Um, so yeah, I've been sort of teaching myself, and, and Playmakers hooked me up with an amazing guitar teacher, and I've been learning. Um, so it's kind of amazing that I get to put this new special skill on my resume, and I'm happy that they were able to trust me with that um, going in because I thought that my chances of actually getting the part because of an experience would not be high at all. So, yeah. Well, you mentioned that your character is so different from you and that your character is more quick, spontaneous, and that you're more. Uh, yeah, she's very impulsive. What happens, and this is something I wonder about, you know, when you're acting a different role, do you find that it then gets incorporated? <laughs> but, but you know what I mean, does it, do you find it starts to show in your own? Yeah, oh yeah, They're, they they creep in, they creep, I, um, this didn't happen to me personally, but I remember um, uh, one of my favorite mentors telling me the story of, um, she played Reagan in a production of uh, King Lear, and um, she would be driving home and just be filled with this enormous at the end, just wanting to like draw, like slam her car into somebody on the road just because she was in that state driving home from rehearsal. So it's scary. It's like, wow. It's a weird thing that happens down the, down the line. But. Yeah, and it's something too that with, with one of the things you work on in training too is how do you approach and how do you leave it? And, then, and I think that there's, yeah. that's something that all actors eventually figure out what your ritual is. And I think it is ritualized largely. And, and sometimes different for each, the needs of a particular production. But especially in those really intense emotional ones, not, not unlike this play, but um, 
where you just have to lead it. You have to, you, you either have to, you know, I'm going, I remember we, we did a play and one of the actors talked about, it was this play, uh, Blue Door. It's a two-hander and it's a really intense emotional piece. And one of the actors like, I go to the gym after, after the show's done and I get on the elliptical and I do it for an hour and then I'm good. And that was his, his ritual for, for get processing that. Yeah, for re-entry. Um, yeah, and then some actors drink a lot. So, <laughs> um, uh, so we only have a couple minutes and I just wanted to bring up a couple things. So we'll be back here, uh, and actually we won't be here, I think we'll be at um, Shannon Road um, for a conversation about assassins. And that will be next month. And Jeff is in Assassin. All right. I am. Thanks for that. Um, so this is why I have a really big beard right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm getting my, my 19th century look on. Um, so, so we'll be back for a conversation about assassins. And do you have the date for that? By I don't. That's okay. why I was just I should know checking. that too. But, you know, we'll get to the information. So I hope you can come back for that conversation. And then also on March 20th, we're hosting a dinner with the Program of the Humanities at UNC. It's, a, um, it's inspired by Dinner Party Download. It's a uh, four course meal uh, with guided conversation. We have Tim Carter from UNC's music department is gonna be talking about Sondheim. Um, we have Carrie Levine from the art department talking about art and violence. Uh, we'll have performances from uh, Assassins and Joe Hodge will be talking a little bit about our reasons for um, producing the piece and a larger sort of con uh, conversation about guns in America. Um, so that's all happening on March 20th, and it includes, uh, the price of admission includes all of the, the conversation and entertainment, but of course a delicious meal that is being specifically designed for this, uh, for this event. Uh, so you can find out information about that at humanities.unc.edu. Um, really cool program, it's, we're calling it Table Talk, and we're hoping to do it on an ongoing basis um, around the area. So that's and actually, I, know. I do have that date. Okay. It is March 24th. At Southwest. It is no, it's here. Oh, is it here? It's here. Okay, great. I was it's wrong. here at 7 p.m. I'll check with Joanne if there has been any change. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let you know. No, I mean, but that's, that's yeah. Same. In the Wings, Playmakers on Assassin. Great. Excellent. Great. So I well, hope please, to see you back here. Please, good, good. We love having you all. Okay. And thank, thank you so much. much. Please join me in. Thank you. Thank you.